My topic today is the early teachers of Christ. Um, I was going to go over the purity uh, teachings, but I do cover some of that. So it is in there and the codes and the vows and so forth. So I do have that in there. Now, um, let me move forward in this. I got a lot to go through and people that know my presentations in the past, they're very meaty, but I try to be colorful with images because I'm a visual designer and artist. Uh, so I like to include that. And uh, of course, we've gone through with me and I just mentioned that I do channel Christ and uh, Neil gave me a beautiful presentation. I mean, an introduction. Thank you. So uh, I always like to tell people what I'm going to talk about so they know exactly how it's going to go. And so we're going to go into the rituals, the routines uh, and the belief system of the Essenes as I as I perceive it. OK, and then we're going to go into the mystery school teachings, the really juicy stuff as well as the preparation of the Messiah. And then we have a message from Jesus. Uh, and so here we go. So the, so the information um, that what I used for this, I read uh, three books that I really concentrated on. I have been uh, in this deep dive going through. I mean, it's been a personal uh, growth thing for me, but uh, the Edgar Casey and the Mysterious Essenes, Jesus and the Essenes, and they walk with Jesus, both Dolores Cannon, uh, as well as my own personal experiences as an Essene teacher and prophet, prophetess, uh, and then as well as on my own channeled information, because when I'm reading it, I'll get like feedback, like the peanut gallery for either my angels or from Christ, the, they'll tell me. I also looked at Anna, uh, the grandmother of Jesus. Um, I didn't like that so much being a channeler because it was present time. And then they talk about certain things at present time. Whereas I will tell you with Dolores Cannon's work, Edgar Case is a little dif difficult as um, King James style. It's a little difficult to read, but with the Dolores Cannon, you have um, someone that I will reference. It's called Sudi, S-U-D-I. It's a woman. It used to be a man who was in a scene. And it's when you really go into these deeper trances, which I am a trance channel, but I've also had almost 400 hours of past life regression. You get detail, you get, um, you get evidence. It's evidential because then later on you go, really? I didn't know. And then you go look and find out it's true. All right. So um, just want to tell you my sources and so forth. The Essenes rituals, routines, and religious beliefs. Now, I'm going to give you just a quick background as I see it. Now, you might have heard some of this before, but again, it's my spin. I always like to start from the beginning and then go forward. So the, the scrolls were found by basically a boy that lost a goat that was looking for it. And he threw a rock in a cave and it went clink. And I, I don't know if it probably broke it. And so he what's in there. So they found the scrolls. So that was 1947. But they really didn't start doing the excavations till 1950. And uh, there were quite a bit of scrolls. Here's a picture of it with the jars. And you can see where uh, Qumran is right here in comparison to the Dead Sea and Jerusalem, uh, um, Bethlehem. You can see in the Jordan River where they, they meet together, just to give you, uh, you know, kind of a location. So what does the word Essene mean? I looked at it from different meanings. The word Essene is Greek for S-O-I, if I said that right. I don't know. S-O-I, which means holy. Edgar Casey interpreted the name as seeing means expectancy. He felt it meant the word meant expectancy, which is waiting for the Messiah. The Essenes were also called keepers of the covenant. Now, who were these Essenes? They were they were a spiritual secret community that was made up of non-traditional Jews, Protestant, Protestants, and others. They were not all. Um, most were non-traditional in some way. Now, the. <laughs> They went, they did not follow traditional Jewish tradition. So we'll get into that later. And so these were the spiritual seekers. Their teachings were of and for the one true God. That just saying that gives me the chills. To be pure in heart and prepare for the Messiah. It seemed beliefs were not politically aligned with traditional Judaism or Roman Catholic teachings. And you, you want to say more Roman, there were Romans there. They also taught the early mystery teachings brought about from Atlantis and Egypt. So when these were, um, like through the uh, the past life regressions with Sudi, he said this was generational talk, this, this, the, the mystery teachings. So where was it really located? This was in Qumran on Mount Carmel. It was about four miles from Nazareth. This was a very large structure. This wasn't some little simple thing in a couple of tents. This was a big, a big to do. And uh, there were some people that lived in nearby tents and caves. I mean, because naturally there were caves built into the, the mountain, 
that was just the way it was, but this was a structure. Now I want to talk about the structural in particular, because just like Atlantis, when I talk about the structure, there's reasons for things. Okay. So the large walls encapsulated this community. It kept it from invaders or, you know, wandering animals that, you know, they didn't want to have like a water buffalo walk in. So that was one thing. Um, uh, and so it was, um, the way it was, it was pr a protective, uh, mechanism, the way it was laid out and Mount Carmel was considered a holy place by Elijah. Now there's more that considered it a holy place, um, through the Bible and so forth, but I'm going to stick, I don't have time for the whole, I could go into all these rabbit holes, but Elijah, who was a beloved prophet of God, whose name means many wells, Merkabah. That's really cool. He was transfigured, ascended, transfigured into the angel Sandalphon, like uh, Enoch transfigured into Metatron. So you can see um, the structure here and you can see it, this little map here. And so they had aqueducts, they had um, kitchens, they had laundry, they had uh, places where they bathe, males in one area, females in others. I mean, they had, I mean, it was thought through. And so what was the community like? You've got a couple stories here. They share common walls between them and they call co-joining or common walls. Families did live together. They had a section like apartments where the males would live together and they have little rooms and then they'd come together in a place to eat. Same for the women. Uh, the married couples had um, their own section and the children in one area and the, the parents in another and, and so uh, the two story, what was interesting to me in the book uh, that was, uh, was it the, the Essenes right here? Excellent, excellent book. You can't even get it, Kindle. Uh, and this, the other one, They Walk With Jesus is very good. But they talk about that on the second floor, there was a study area where they kept these sacred skull, scrolls. And they even had a bronze big statue of a planetary system. So it was, uh, they kept it and they had a skylight, but they kept it where it'd be a little dark to protect the uh, the scrolls from being damaged. So how did they live? How did they get food and water? In this commune, it was a commune style, but it was kind of like a fortress because it was protected. They grew their own fruits, lemons, oranges, trees. The trees were figs, they are dates. They would eat that, uh, palm. They also had several running water sources from underground springs. And you could see in here this uh, Jerusalem's water source. And then they're showing there's water sources underneath. This is Qumran's water source. There's water sources underneath that they had. They share common areas at the temple. And I discussed earlier about, you know, the male, female, but they had courtyards. Uh, you know, everyone was welcome in certain areas, courtyards. Now the bathing was separate, but they had fountains that they uh, used for ceremonial type things. And then they had uh, dining. Uh, the dining was broken up depending where you were. It was a, it's a big, it was a big compound. So uh, were marriages and children acceptable? Uh, yes, but abstinent codes were encouraged. So they were hoping that um, you would, um, you know, be prudent the single males had their own living quarters as well as the females. And most of them were all students or they were servants for a set time assisting with dining or laundry. Meaning if they really screwed up for penance, they go, okay, well, I'll do the laundry for three months for everybody. <laughs> That's what they did. So marriages were arranged by the elders and, and we'll get into the, the ranks, the elders and the assistants of astrology. They did actually chart planning uh, through the gu and guidance from the Holy Spirit. If an arrangement was refused, they could not marry or remarry another. Like, if you don't want this dude, they offer you this woman. You're like, that was it. That was your choice. That was your one choice. You couldn't marry another. It wasn't like you have another option. Many of the married couples had children, but it wasn't required nor expected. And below, you know, this is from a film. Uh, and it's Joseph and Mary, Baby Jesus, but it was from a movie. Uh, I think it's Olivia Wilde, not Olivia Wilde, Olivia I forgot her name. She was French. Anyway, Joseph was 36 years old when he met Mary. Joseph, uh, they were finding several women, young women, uh, with the Essenes through training and so forth. Uh, and they kept them separate. And uh, Mary was actually selected by an angel in the temple in Mount Carmel on the stairs. And she had this, you know, this uh, apparition, this vision, whatever, of an angel. And she was the one who was supposed to carry the Messiah, but she was 16. All right. So the Essenes prophesied there would be an actual birth of the Christ. 
And it was rumored that the birth was in a cave. Caves then were used as mangers. They might not have been this high up, but caves were convenient. And so this is the only image I found of people. It's a drawing in a cave because uh, they say manger. We think these little, uh, you know, like you see at the holidays set aside alone, but no, they, they, a lot of them were in caves and they were, um, they did not have a place to stay. So they may do. All right. What was the dress of the attire at the time? Men and women wore plain linen or wool robes with no color. So, you know, beiges, whites. Men generally wore their hair down to their shoulders with or without a beard. It was up to the person. Women wore their hair long and didn't cut it. They were encouraged not to. Some wore, wore veils or scarves around the head. Some d you didn't have to. And both wore leather sandals. Now, what was their spiritual beliefs? They believed in the one true God. No other gods, no idolatry no sacrifices, no addictions. They didn't permit that. They believed wisdom and truth must be shared with all that are interested, male and females alike. The Essenes were not just a religious set, but they, their very existence was a way of life. Sharing things and service was based on a reward system. There was no money used. So for example, if you did a really good job tilling in the garden uh, or harvesting the fruit that you get the guitar for a week, <laughs> That's how they did it. So customs or rituals did they practice? They had an attitude of joy, love, and kindness to all. One true God and no others acknowledge. They followed the law of Moses. Now, the law of Moses is 10 commandments, but they had 12. There was one about Baal, like don't lower yourself or don't follow Baal, which is kind of dark. So that's a good idea. But they had 12 commandments. Uh, we're back to nothing is really owned. It's shared in this merit type system. The uh, renewal cleansings, we would consider that baptism now, but they would did this renewal cleansing. It's usually a one-time deal. You didn't keep going back every week and it was in their fountain. Now this is supposed to be uh, Jesus with John the Baptist, but uh, in this, in the, in, you know, the, in the, the Jordan river, but for now, I'm just telling you it was in a fountain and it was to, to be the renewal of your mind, body, and spirit. And usually um, again, it was done in these fountains, but you could wear a robe, but it was preferred nude because it was symbolic that you're shedding the old skin and you're coming back anew. And, uh, John the Baptist also learned from the Essenes as well as Jesus. So they learned that from there and the sharing of the unity of the cup of wine, they would take one cup of wine and they would share it. Uh, and they meant one blood, one God. So, uh, other things they practice, no violence. No weapons were ever found. They did use spiritual weapons to protect themselves, such as prayers and mind control and fusing and crystals and sound frequencies. Um, they would use that as a protection mechanism, but they didn't have what you would consider things that humans had for weapons at that time. No animal sacrifices. Instead, if they did a ceremony, they would not use an animal sacrifice. They would use sandalwood oil and an incense burner uh, in place of that, they had no slaves, although there were some slaves at the time there, like with the Romans, but they didn't have any slaves. But then, although they did have servants, but for a penance of time, they would work off, you know, most of them were students and the teachers recommended they do that. Cleanliness is holiness. They were really into bathing. The, the, the daily baths of, uh, cleaning your body and also cleaning your clothes. Sacred burial rituals included wrapping the body in linen. They used frankincense and myrrh mainly for odor, um, mainly for odor, but there was also some ceremonial things with that, but it's mainly odor to, um, and they would, once they did that, and which is very unheard of in Jewish tradition, but many of them uh, in the Essene practice burn the bodies, which is another thing that is not Jewish. So they just, this whole ashes to ashes, they really like that concept. And the daily ritual that they had, uh, this is examples of bathing, and this is their uh, bathing areas. You may have one for male or female, so this is what they would look like. And they would use, if they couldn't create a soap, they would use pumice stones to get the oils and the dirt off. And of course, they had a separate area where they did laundry that didn't use the same place. And they felt cleanliness kept diseases and sickness away, and it, it does. <laughs> Okay, so per Edgar Casey, what was the Essene's purpose? Now I'm saying per him, he has a specific viewpoint. 
prepare the spiritual birth to be born anew in the spiritual path, prepare people to be light bearers in a dark world, prepare preparation of the Christos, which means the Messiah child and his teachings. And some carried the Christ message in the world. Others took on Christ consciousness, which is losing of self to be of service to others. And I guess you could do both. Her Casey, what are the three vows of the Essenes? Abstain from wine, I guess, unless it's when you're doing, you know, communion. No addictions were tolerated. It was an entryway for lower spirits to attach. And that's still true now. If you, you know, if you lower your, your spiritual resistance, and also lowers your vibe. Uh, refrain from cutting your hair. Long hair is associated with spiritual powers. It wasn't even in times when uh, I think it was Hitler used prophets to find secret information. <laughs> They all had long hair. There, there's a there's a reason why a lot of priestesses have long hair. Uh, they're like antennae. Uh, avoid contact with corpses and graves. And I and I, and then I ask. So so a lot of these I ask like uh, uh, abstain from one. I'm like okay, I know why because things can try to enter. I've had personal experience with that, and it's true. I mean, you got to be a master and handle it. But the hair thing. 100 percent, i agree on that uh corpses and graves i think it's because they're lower vibe frequency spirits and they just want to be spiritual them spiritually clean and stay away from that so now we're going to get into the mystery school teachings and spiritual abilities but we got to stop here for the good stuff what is a soul group now this came from the edgar casey uh let me see this book right here okay and again hard to read because it's like King James, which I like the King James version of the Bible. I've got several renditions of that, uh, but that it's hard to read though. So what are soul groups? They have shared collective memory that they mutually of things that they are mutually, they like, or detest, like they detest people that cover up truth, right? But they really, really like people that are uh, freely express themselves, that kind of thing. So it would be a shared message. Like you would see, like, we are the people in the constitution. Uh, or the spirit of 76, something that they all kind of believe in. They find each other and travel through time with one another to finish incomplete karma. They are completing unfinished business with one another and in this world together, which means you may have things with one another you need to handle, but then you've got things collectively as the whole soul group. The laws of the universal karma bring them together and again with the same cause. For example, the Nazis and the Jews and overcoming suppression, Catholic reform or the Pradas. I mean, there, there's there's several of these loops. And then Edgar Casey himself in his reading said that some of them might flow like this. And I felt like this was kind of mine here because I've done a lot of past life. Late Atlantis to late Egypt to early Greece to Jerusalem, Rome, the time of Jesus to France, to the American Civil War to Nazi Germany and war. So there's different paths. Okay. There's different ones. Do you think you were in a scene? I want you to think about this. Do you believe in the one true God and no other gods, no idolatry? Do you believe in sharing wisdom and truth with all that are interested? Do you believe that we can do things that Christ taught us? Do you have a Christ conscious mind that wants to be of service to others? And do you have spiritual healing gifts that you feel is from God and to help this world? Chances are you're in a scene. Let's come back to find others like you. So welcome back. Was the school and the Essene school also known as school of prophecy? Yes, it was. The prophets and prophetess trained in Qumran with the Essenes. Many had gifts of the Holy Spirit and were told to go there, share, and to learn. The majority of the students had the gift of prophecy to a greater or lesser degree. Nine out of 10 of the women were more gifted in this area. And the many of the women... At, that were also a saint teachers. Um, I found with training, doing a lot of training over the years and the British style of evidential mediumship and trance and channeling and all that, uh, you know, over eight years, 600 mediums, I'd say 95% of them were women. I think there, there's re there may be reasons for that we could go into. I'm not saying a man can't do it. I'm just saying there's just generally a lot of women. All right. My life as an Essene female teacher and prophetess, I started as a student. I was very young and my family. So what happened? How did I get this info? Hold up. <laughs> uh, I got this. I went. 
because I can do this. I've had so much past life and in between life that I can go at will. And then I can go into that and I can also ask my guides and they'll tell me, and then I can, and they'll show me pictures. I remember. So I, and they'll, and they'll tell me things I hear. I said, say it again. And then I'll write it down. So, and it's not truly automatic writing. Some is, some isn't. Um, so my family was from the line of Levi and they supported me and they lived there too. My name was Evelyn. And it, and I was told intuitively it meant God's beginning and omnis, omnipotent truth. But then later I found out the word meant life pretty close. Right. At an early age, I was chosen to speak to the angelic realms by angels and God, they actually came to me and said they carried the message, which Jesus did that in 2020. He wanted me to publicly carry his messages. So I, I have a lot of those on my YouTube channel I have Jesus messages because he told me to. So at 16, I taught the spiritual mysteries and I decided with the elders that I did not want to marry, but instead dedicate my life to being a messenger and servant of God and prophetess. So there's a little kid in the red. Actually, they would have all worn white, but the kid's like, eh, I don't know if I do it. And I remember now being asked to be in a play when um, I was about uh, six years. No, no, I was older than that. Maybe I was about eight or 10. And I was asked to play Mary in a play. And it was the big thing in the elementary school. And they said, no, we got to have you. And I'm like, well, who is this Mary? And they said, well, and they told me you get to hold a baby. I said, well, what's my speaking parts? They said, you don't have any. And I'm like, well, is there any that have speaking parts? <laughs> and they said, no, it's an honor. I'm like, eh, I don't know. I just sit there and it seems kind of boring. So anyway, I did do the Mary thing. My mom said, do the Mary thing. Um, so my life as an Essene teacher and prophetess, I regularly channeled and merged, and this was given to me phonetically. And it's a Zacharel, uh, Zachariel, Zachariel, but it was, I got Zach, Zachariel. I got it phonetically anyway, that's how, and I looked it up and I'm like, oh, okay. It's a real, it's a real angel, kind of important angel. So it's a Hebrew archangel called Zachariel, also known as uh, Sarah Quell, Zachariel what is it Zakirel, which means remembrance of god he was one of nine angelic guardians over dominions he was a watcher his power flowed through me for healings and god's messages that we in turn the group carried out often spoke as Zachariel as Ga as well as gabriel and raphael but raphael also went by another name but it was raphael Z anyway my um Z Zacharyl, i called zach for short and he showed me people's hearts and their weaknesses and helped me remove unwanted behaviors and healings because the healings were attached uh, physically to an unwanted emotion. I was also considered a priestess for the Essene and I led a life of simplicity and grace. Now, the original mystery school, what was it created like? Well, uh, drum roll, it came from uh, Father Melchizedek, who was a teacher of Christ. And that goes back and there's whole stories with that and attached to that. We don't have time, but the Essenes used the Melchizedek training, which included and in not excluding, but there's more, but it included things like this, alchemy, consciousness, exercises, sacred geometry, hidden symbolisms, meditation, enhancement of the spiritual gifts, prophecy, astrology, Atlantean stargate technology, inner energy healing with and without crystals, sound frequency, tuning to name a few. Um, and also some of that was used for protection so they could use to focus their energy for, to make invisible walls or to blow people back. And they use Merkabahs too, but again, back to the sacred geometry. So who were the teachers in the Essene community? The Essene teachers were the masters and the elders. That's it. And they taught seeker students, people that were very actively interested in this. The prophets were also students and teachers of the community. And then, of course, Christ the Messiah, he was uh, an Essene teacher. What topics did the Essenes teach the students? Energy healing work on people, planet, and animals. Sound frequency for healing for crystal energy enhancement. Sacred geometry, Merkabah technology, portals, gateways. Knowledge of our planets and solar system. Astrology chart, planning and interpretation. Calming the mind, meditation, chakra centers, and song. How to use frequency and song to elevate to higher levels, angel communication, Holy Spirit, divine messages. Now, uh, their mystery teachings were the sacred math is seen when these sacred geometric shapes, as it revealed, represents life. But basic math, they called it merchant math, was when they counted either tying a knot, you know, here we have an occubus, you know, beads on a string or colored sticks. You know, you got 
10 of these in red, five of these in green. So what were the mystery teachings? They have astrology and star alignment, which they use to help, as I said earlier, finding partners, planting, holding ceremonies, making decisions. And they plotted these astrology charts. They also, through Sudi's, um, which was Dolores Cannon, uh, subject said that they had stargazers that meant glass that meant telescopes which was really unheard of them but they did also stargaze they were they were they were very connected to the stars uh, what about our mystery teachings with the planets they had an understanding of the solar system life on other planets this was taught passed down through the generations through the ancestors they believe that there were 10 planets in the solar system which we know right now there's only nine but the ninth planet, Pluto, which they already stated, was discovered in 1930. So that's kind of outstanding. I mean, they're way ahead of their time. Now, they're saying the 10th planet is called uh, Juno, which we don't have that yet. That has yet to be discovered. So how did they show student and teacher rank in the community? They did this. They, it's just like martial arts. They had little colored belts. So the colored headbands they wore would show spiritual rank. So gray was a young student. Green was a seeker student. Blue. So a young student would have been like a little toddler, four or five, kind of like when Jesus started. And then blue is a master teacher, but you have to pass tests to get here at this point. Elder, you have higher tests and it's also, um, it, you, you're considered one of the elders of the community. So it's way above that. And then red, <laughs> it's like a visitor pass. You know, where they're not from the area, we're just checking out to move into the community. And that just let people know where they were. So preparation of the Messiah. Did Jesus study with these things? Yes, of course he did. He based on the past life sessions with Sudi again, which is through the regressions of a Dolores Cannon with this woman that was Sudi, which was a man. Jesus was brought to these scenes at age four or five years old, trained till he was of age in the Jewish tradition, would have been 13, 14 years old. And uh, he, well, he traveled after that, but he studied up to that point. He would stay with his teachers on the property, as well as take visits back to Nazareth to visit his parents, and they would visit him at school. So it, it wasn't like they just left him there. I mean, they visited, he visited, you know, it was all good. Who was the main prophetess that taught Jesus? Well, um, the, based on the information that I got, and I believe to be true, the elder and master teacher, healer, and prophetess was named Judith, like the book of Judith. And she taught Jesus at the Essene compound. And she was mentioned in the Bible, but not much is said about her. But what was said, is pretty, pretty kind of big. Uh, she was powerful. She was supposed to be the reincarnation of Samson. And so in a past life, she was very fiery. She had physical strength and she had mental strength. She was a powerful personality all around. So how did the three magi finally help Jesus in his learning? So we know about they showed up in the bright star, which the star was a collection of stars, and it had a trail that went right down to the, the location of the Messiah birth. So, you know, did they just show up when he never saw him again? He saw him again. The three wise men, the magi from Babylon, knew the Eastern spiritual practices. They had been following Christ's teaching from the Essenes from a distance, and they were prepared to help when he was of age. Later, Judith arranged for her and Jesus to get training in the Far East. However, Jesus' uncle, I think it's Aramaeus, I think is his name, of finance much of the overseas study through the family construction business. And so he came along to make it seem like it was a family business, uh, but in actuality, Jesus was getting sacred tra training. Now, let me say this. Uh, at this point, um, Joseph, I think, had passed, so the uncle was kind of taking over, you know, being like a father, but it was a big family business. Not only did they make houses, they made furniture, and Jesus apparently was supposed to be really good at making the furniture. He could do both, but he was really good at that because you couldn't go, um, you know, to a furniture store. That's what they did. They had to make everything. So uh, back again, what are the two spiritual rituals that the Essenes taught Jesus that became a part of modern Christianity. And that was water baptism, uh, releasing the old and renewed in, in, renewed in spirit um, and communion. And that sharing, drinking the wine, symbolizing the blood of Christ. But it goes back further than that. So where were Jesus' spiritual tasks? It was talked about 
um, by others. And that was, of course, the 40 days in the desert with Satan. He had three tests to pass where he asked him the three questions. And he was very clever in his responses. We don't have time to go there. But that was one. Doesn't sound like fun to me, but he passed that. And then the, actually the Jesuits follow similar things to the, uh, what is it? The four phases of Christ, the Jesuits do that and the, um, Ignatius religion. So per Casey's reading, when training in Egypt, Jesus had to spend three days in the King's chamber at the great pyramid in Giza to see if he could survive it. Much like the Atlantean final priestess test, which I know about because I was a high priestess in Atlanta. <laughs> Uh, you had to stay in there and you had to, you know, get past your NDE and get back. That's just what they did. It wasn't always a tomb. They had other things. They would put you on a river with crocodiles. That was another one. That's another story. But this was a test. The greatest test was to survive ridicule, stabs, and punches from the crowd. People think, oh, he's just hung in the cross and all that and, and the old nails through. He, people... It was awful. I mean, I, it was very hard for me to read. People would come out of the crowd and some he knew and just stab him. So he was messed up before he got nailed to the cross. So he had stabs and punches from the crowd. Then he, it was quite a commotion. And then you had Judas beforehand that was paid to stir things up way before things got to where they were. And so you had a riled up crowd. Then you had his followers trying to protect him. And then so you had fights. You had the Romans arresting him. I mean, it was a mess. And so he was carrying this heavy cross. He did have one person in the room and said, okay, you could help him. Uh, but he had a lot before he even had his feet and nails, you know, the hands go through all that or really the rest um, and being stabbed in the ribs. So he had to have been in tremendous amount of pain. He endured this the whole time saying they know not what they do and telling the thief he'll see him that day in paradise. He also said, God, have you forsaken me? Which, you know, he's probably bummed out. But I mean, the fact is that he was still in awareness of this, what he had to do. I just, it blows my mind. So what prophecies did the Essenes make? They said that a Messiah would be born through the bloodline of David uh, as a Nazarene. Now, the bloodline of David, I'm just going to say, I have seen Jesus and two of my near-death experiences. So I'm once in June 18, 2018, physical, right in broad daylight as a solid. He was gorgeous. Okay. Um, he has like a chestnut reddish brown hair and blonde going through it. <clears throat> and his eyes are like blue green. They're very unusual. Well, they said that the line of David had red hair and they had blonde going through it. Not all, everybody had dark eyes. And they, everyone that met Jesus said his eyes would change from blue to like blue green. They were just, it was like looking at a, through a portal. So the king of Jews would be born under this bright star. And we talked about there were clusters of stars that formed that tail. And that did happen. The Christ would be embodiment of the living God displaying powers. They were afraid of Jesus because he was healing and people would trick him with healing. They would say, oh yeah, we need someone to be healed. And they didn't. And he would call him out. He would say, no, I think I'm, I'm, my, I'm not needed here. Uh, and he knew that. And uh, it, it's just, you know, so, but they followed him. He also, some people who refused healing, so I don't know if you know that. And he would say, no, what's needed here is this. And he would explain. He explained this to a guy by being blind was important. Afterwards, the guy changed his life, his attitude, everything. So the death came as a result of the, you know, the betrayal of Judas and getting the silver and land. They gave him land. He didn't use it very long because he killed himself. He felt so guilty, I guess. Uh, the Essenes used the symbol of a cross to mean salvation. So they used that before Jesus ever even got on a cross because they knew about the crucifix. So what prophecies did the Essenes make? They made the, the, that Christ's death, the body would rise. So what does that mean? I don't know, but they were told that just like when I get information, what does that mean? Would rise and be seen once more. Many people in the area after his death in far land saw Jesus body healthy and glowing. I did June 18th, 2018. That's, it was amazing. It lasted three or four minutes. It was very euphoric. Jesus had survived death through transfiguration and ascension. And of course he told us what it, he can do, we can do. So uh, I guess is seeing the trap. What, af what happened after his death? Some, some people actually heard a disembodied voice say, this is my beloved son with whom I am pleased. I mean, it was several people supposed to have heard that. Some did and some didn't. It's like seeing a UFO. It's right there. Some people see it and they're right there. And some people are right there and they don't see it. But they, some people heard that. The tomb was unopened. It was undisrupted, but there was no body. But it's like it evaporated because the clothes were just right in that place. 
People in the community, even in faraway lands, saw Jesus intact, healthy and glowing. Christ followers and teachers called themselves the way and bearers of the light. And again, um, as we get closer to, to God, to Christ, to the divine, to all these type of seen type people, uh, Mother Mary, uh, you know, Mary, you know, Mary the Magdalene, um, as you get into these higher states, I, I've glowed. You can glow. I'm just telling you, I've, I've I did, it was by accident. It's been on film several times. <laughs> You'll have to watch it when we do the angel thing, because I'm going to fish out some videos, but you can glow. You know, I'm not talking about transfiguration. I'm talking about glowing. So what I'm are the two? Just the heads up, you have 15 minutes. 15? Okay, yeah. cool. Okay, so what? Thank you. What two commandments did Jesus teach the world? Lo he taught the world that influenced by the Essenes and love God. They called uh, the father Abba. Abba the father with all your heart. Love your neighbor like yourself. So I think they meant it not like a male, female. I think they meant it like a parental thing. So right on time, Neil. <laughs> right, You're, you are perfect. Look at you. Mine, mine, Look at you. Mine, mine. Okay. So this is what we're going to do. All right. This is going to be fun times. So um, I try to make everything really comprehensive. I'm so glad I got this done. So we got 20 minutes, right? Or is that it? We have 15 minutes. Perfect. Okay, so this is what's going to happen. I'm going to go, I'm going to tell you how this works. And I've never, this has never been done this level. I'm going to go into a deeper trance. This is cool. So what I'm going to have you, Neil, is I'm going to go in, I'm going to do some breaths. I'm going to tell everybody what's going to happen. And then what um, I, I channel Jesus a lot. But when you go into the higher states, I have to really be trusted. So those of you watching, just uh, I visualize this beautiful um, God bubble with angels around. So just keep me in this protective mechanism because I'm going to go deeper. So y'all can pray for me and keep me in this. Just visualize that. And then I'm going to go in these deeper states, right? Because why people don't is you can get hijacked, but I'm not worried about it because we got, we got, we got, <laughs> we got this guy coming through. It's going to be good. Okay. Um, and so once I do that and have the message, whatever that is, I have no idea what he's going to say, but his energy feels so good. Y'all, I love doing it. It just gets me so high. I just, I mean, it just feels great. Then Neil, I'm going to say as Jesus, okay, I'm going to say, you're going to have to keep track of time because I won't know. So just huh? be gentle and say, I'm going to say I'm ready for questions. He already knows that. Right. Yeah. And so you're going to ask me the questions and you're going to talk slowly and so-and-so and then stop and then I'll answer it. And then, and then you go into the next one and we might, I don't know how much time we'll have for, I don't know what he'll respond. And then after you feel like the timing is, I still need a, three or four minutes to go over my last little thing. I have a free class I'm offering. So I don't need, you know, and, or maybe questions. So maybe five minutes at the end. So if you could just bring us back with a couple, just two or three breaths, and I need to center myself back in the room. If you could bring us back mm -hmm. um, and just have everybody be in a state of gratitude, but I need help coming back. Yeah. So when you're coming back, you want me to go ahead and just guide everyone to through two breaths as you're coming back into your body. I mean, three, three would be breathe in and breathe out. Three would be perfect. Cause then I could anchor myself back and, and cause I step, but what happens is I step away and have them step in. And sometimes my face will change and everything is, is really, it's really cool. <laughs> Anyhow. And then, and then I'll have that little bit of time to wrap it up at the end with the free offer. And then we can talk if you want to. All right. Well, okay. we, we have, we technically only have 10 minutes, but we'll make it 15 now. So we have 10 minutes of questions and then you want five minutes, right? We'll do this, this, the thing won't last that long with what we're doing. Uh, you'll yeah. make it last as long. It lasts as long as it lasts. And then I just need five minutes toward the end so okay, I can wrap it. up so we can talk and then I can get my offer. That's all. But, um, Perfect. okay. You ready? So what I'm going to do now, um, is I'm going to take what I do, and I'll just describe it as I, when I take three deep cleansing breaths, as I visualize this beautiful golden light, the one I saw in the near death experience. And I have a free 30 minute Christ like meditation on my school. If you sign up the Academy of Divine and Wisdom, but anyway, when you breathe in, um, I start getting high and it raises me right up to my five Christ 
a crown chakra. So that's what I'm doing. I'm releasing anything old. And then I have them step kind of blend and blend into my core where my heart is. So that's, so just give me a few minutes now. Okay. And, and, and by the way, everyone listen, not just with your head, listen with your heart. Okay. Listen with your heart and, and just be in a state of gratitude. That's a different way of listening. I'm telling him how much I love him and how much I appreciate all the things he's taught me and all the things he's done for me. My beloveds, I am the one that is grateful to be here today for we found each other once more. My heart, my heart is illuminated. The love that I feel, the work that's being done, our work that's being done, you are the lights. The light has not been diminished, but my light and my transfiguration is in use. We share this glory of God. We are one. This dissension and duality and the wars and the rumors of wars and the pestilence, the all the things that's occurring that you see and you hear about. It has no seniority over the one that has always been, over the one that I live and shines through me and all of us. For we are the children of the most high and of the one that loves us the most and the creator source of all things. No, there is no reason to ever feel sad or feel down for you should wear your crown on your head high for you are chosen. And I have marked each of you and I know who you are. And only solitude, prosperity, and love will come your way. And all your good works that you've done, and all the light that you are bringing forth into this world, all is noted. Not one thing is left out. Not the long hours of study. Not the tiring of your body with the travels. Not working through the finances to get the education or to do the requirements that you need so you can move forward with your spiritual practice of love. It's all seen. It's all seen, all the striving. And it's because you love, your first love is not your family. Your first love is to love is to love the one that is and the one that's in all of us. Your first love is creation. Mm -hmm.